Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and I'll be your host for the next hour of answering those gardening questions. You can get in touch with us by dialing 1-800-676-5446. If you'd rather send us pictures or emails for a future show, that address is byf at unl.edu. And we do need to know where you live. Give us as much information as you can so we can give you a good answer. Do not forget to follow us on Facebook. Check out our video features on the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel. All right, let's get started with samples, and I'm afraid the dreaded Japanese beetles are here, Kyle. Yes, they, they have arrived, and so I, I brought a couple in with me tonight. So, you know, our, most of our viewers aren't going to need any introduction to Japanese beetles. They're, they're well experienced with these in the landscape. Um, so we've seen these emerging, um, really, I would say, the eastern uh, third of the state so far. Um, according to degree day models, um, probably expect those to be emerging pretty much statewide within the next week or so. Um, and so, you know, people are already really familiar with them, but one of the things I wanted to really talk about tonight was, um, you know, considering managing, you know, really think about managing these guys um, early, especially if you've had uh, a history of problems with Japanese beetles. Um, you know, one of the interesting things with these is that um, as they feed, they, they damage the plant. The plant produces these uh, volatile compounds, um, which then attract more beetles into the plant. And so one of the things that you can really do to help uh, mitigate issues from these is try to limit that damage as much as possible. And I know sometimes that's a lot easier said than done. But if you can start early and try to keep those plants from getting damaged, it's really going to help you know, limit the amount that are, are coming in further. So. There's no one-size-fits-all um, option for, for controlling these. Um, sometimes hand-picking can be a, a good option in small settings. Um, you know, there's options to provide short-term control for a matter of like a couple of days with products like uh, neem or, um, or, or pyrethrin. Or you have some, uh, in some cases, options like uh, carbaryl or bifenthrin, pyrethroids that can provide up to a couple weeks of protection. You know, it really all just depends on, on what kind of plants you're looking at. So, you know, that's something to, to look into, see what, you know, whatever you're trying to control them on, uh, what's labeled for those. Um, and then, you know, the final thing I would say is I get a lot of questions about um, uh, controlling the grubs and if that's going to have any impact on the amount of adults that you're seeing in the landscape. And the simple answer is no, not really. So I don't really recommend doing anything for the grubs in, in your turf unless you're actually seeing turf injury. Um, but really there's not a, any strong relationship between the, the grubs in your lawn and uh, the amount that you'll have in your landscape. But um, time to watch out for those and, and manage them as early in, as you can. Thank you, Kyle, unfortunately. <laughs> All right, Matt, you brought sprinkles. Yeah, I brought sprinkles, something cool to look at. <laughs> so with this year and last year and you know what we're going through this summer, a lot of people are having dead patches in their lawns or dead lawns completely. So it's time to probably start think about seeding for the fall. Right now is probably the worst time to start seed. Any time in July is not a good time just because we have these high 100 degree temperatures, high humidity. So it makes it really difficult to grow grass this time of year. So if we can wait until August 15th would be the ideal date or you know even that second first second week in August um, we'll have a lot better chance than starting them now so what I have here is just some different seeds that are from uh, local box stores so some of them are Scott's Pennington Vigoro uh, and what they do is they coat their seeds uh, with either fertilizer or some sort of polymers to help absorb water so they do have a good uh, way of putting these coatings on the seeds and getting them to establish quickly. And a lot of them have uh, starter fertilizer in them as well. So if we're planning to seed, um, first off, seed selection is probably really important. We wanna make sure that we're choosing one that's in our lawn and that can match what we're doing. So if you have bluegrass and you plant fescue, it's probably gonna be a different color, uh, different times of the year. So you wanna make sure you know what grass you have. And then another thing is uh, looking at some of them that have like annual ryegrass in them. Uh, so those will grow really fast and you'll probably be mowing like three inches off a week or twice a week. So be careful when you're choosing certain grasses like these. Um, a lot of them do have like just tall fescue or just Kentucky bluegrass in them. So those are the ones you want to go with if you know that's what your lawn is. 
Uh, and the coatings are good, uh, but you still want to make sure that you're going to put a starter fertilizer down, let's say, two to three weeks after seeding, just to give those, you know, a bigger bump and going into the fall, uh, you'll have a good stand of grass. So thinking forward, maybe check out some of those seeds or go to your local seed store and get them without the coatings. Uh, one thing to know is when you buy a 10 pound bag of coated seed, usually half of it's seed and half of it's coating. So you're getting less seed, but that seed is in pretty good shape to be established. So something right. to think about. All right, thanks, Matt. Okay, Kyle, the dreaded leaf spots. <laughs> yes, the leaf spots. And you know, unfortunately this is, with how dry it's been, most of the things that I'm looking at, most landscapes and gardens, at least my garden, is disgustingly healthy at least the part stuff that's not dying from drought. But in those areas where we are getting irrigation, we are seeing some of these leaf spots showing up. And this is rust on a penstemon. And so this is our, one of our dark, dark tower penstemons, very susceptible to, to, the, um, to this rust um, caused by the fungus Buccinia coronata. But it kind of starts off, you'll get these spots on the lower leaves. Typically they maybe will have a little bit of orange or red um, on the, on the margins. And the fun thing about them, if you look at the underside of the leaf, you can actually see the spores. And here we go. And so we're seeing all of these, all these little bumps or kind of, um, kind of dots inside of this, inside of this lesion. Those are the actual rust pustules. And when we get water splashing, it will splash on these pustules and they will splash up and land on the upper leaves or they'll land on the neighboring leaves, or they will move to um, move into your neighbor's lawn. Uh, one of the things about a lot of the rust and a lot of the leaf spots that we're seeing on, on our, um, on our, in, our, in our landscapes, they don't require a lot of management. Um, your plants can, they can tolerate, they can tolerate some damage. You know, the nice thing is, is we're, right now we're not really into the, um, into the midst of the season where we're seeing a lot of leaf spot diseases. But at most, these penstemon are going to defoliate a couple of weeks early. You're gonna get some cool extra colors on these as well. So really nothing to worry about in most situations. If it's a high value landscape, you can consider using a, um, a product like Dacanil or, some, or something. But for the most part, just let them be and try to enjoy the extra color. All right, thank you, Kyle. Okay, Sarah, you have boys and girls. I do. So our vegetable gardens should be moving into some pretty good levels of production right now at this point in the season. And I just wanted to bring a reminder for uh, gardeners that with our cucurbits, which includes the summer squash, the zucchini, pumpkins, watermelon, um, that they, all of those plants have male and female flowers. And you can see that really easily when you look at the flowers. The female flowers obviously have a little tiny fruit right here at the base. Now, if this was a pumpkin flower, you'd see a little round, miniature pumpkin fruit right there. If it was zucchini, you'd see a little dark green immature fruit. As compared to this flower, which is a male flower, and you can tell that because there is no immature fruit here at the base of the stem. So um, it's very common for cucurbits to, to develop more male flowers than they do female flowers. Um, male flowers often are favored by cooler weather, cloudier conditions. So as we move into the hotter part of the summer, um, hopefully you'll get more and more female flowers. Um, so if you're not really getting a good harvest yet, you might go out and actually check to see how many female flowers your plants are producing. The other thing to keep in mind is that cucurbit flowers are edible. So if you have way, way too many male flowers and you want to harvest a few of them, uh, you know, you could certainly deep fat fry them or add them to a salad or do something fun like that uh, instead of just letting them go to waste in the garden. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Okay. First round of pictures, Kyle. This one comes to us from Ainsworth. Uh, she's never seen a fly like this before. She just wants to know what this beautiful thing is. Yeah, it's a, it's a picture wing fly. Uh, Delphinia picta is the species, and it's actually a very common uh, fly. It is a really beautiful one, and they're just uh, decomposers, so that the larvae are in all kinds of um, you know decomposing material. All right, excellent. Uh, the next one, you have two pictures. And he just wants to know what this is and whether this is something that he needs to control. Definitely not something to control. This is a bearing beetle, and um, they are—they're actually really, really interesting beetles. So um, they 
Um, basically, they recycle um, animal carcasses. They help recycle those back into back into uh, uh, the ecosystem. So um, these will will bury those carcasses and then take care of their young. Um, they even have parental care where they, they care for their young um, within that that animal carcass. And you know they're they're also good because they have a, a relationship with phoretic mites that basically those mites then um, help uh, kill different fly eggs within um, carrion. And so it, you know, they, the presence of these um, helps reduce the flies that you would have in, in your landscape too. So a burying beetle and, and that's something you want to have around. All right, and one more. And uh, this is, he's just going after the bee balm flowers. So they're wondering what this is. Yeah, it's a snowberry clear wing moth. So it's one of the sphinx or spinget or hummingbird moths, kind of just a common name for that family. Perfect, all right, thanks Kyle. All right, these come to us, Matt, um, from Lake of the Ozarks, and it's his zoysia. He sent us four pics here, so you can get the, the general appearance. He's power raked, et cetera, et cetera. He's used imidacloprid for the grub preventer for the last two years. Um, what do we think is going on here? Yeah, I don't know, that, that is a tough one. So it's zoysia grass that's not doing well. That's right. not a good thing unless you're in Nebraska and you want it to die, but. <laughs> Uh, so I don't know what it looks like is your your side hills looks good is what was said in the question And then that bottom it's more of a flat area. So I don't know if there's an issue with Overwatering there or if the water is beholding in the soil in a saturated soil that's causing some disease in that grass um, If you're do if you are treating for insects, you would think you'd be able to rule out the chinch bugs um, but it could be some fungal disease in the root system if it is staying saturated in that the lower areas whereas in the rest of the lawn on the side hills it's fine so I, that's something to think about uh, sounds like you're doing everything right if you're power raking some some of that zoysia gets really thatchy and aerification helps as well so um, I would look into your soil and see what you have maybe stick a probe in the ground and see if that soil is holding water saturated I don't know do you have any other well, I was I was gonna say it kind of looks a little bit like large patch which is the same the same pathogen that causes um, brown patch in our cool season turfs but it's large patch in in our warm season turfs and so you can actually pull up some of that grass rinse off the soil and look at the dirt or, or look at the roots and if you're seeing rotted roots good chance that we are dealing with with that large patch fungus all, all right, right. Uh, one picture on this next one Matt this is a burnt area in the lawn. It's about 10 by 10 fertilizer and then liquid fungicide. He watered, et cetera. He wonders, is this because of fertilizer and fungicide? Mm. What do we think here? This is the only picture he sent. Yeah, so, so it, it's, it's tough to tell if it's an application issue with this picture. Although just by the pattern, it almost looks like there's maybe some different grasses in this picture. Um, because there's a nice circle in there. So that, that big brown patch might be like rough bluegrass or something that might have been susceptible to a nitrogen application that it could have burned the grass or it could also be astochyta, which would be burning those leaf tips down and it would recover if there's still green underneath there. All right, thanks. Kyle, you have two picks on this first one. She's wondering, does this hosta have hosta virus X? Maybe. It's really hard to tell. Um, some hostas just look like this. The only real way to tell is to, uh, to, is to submit a sample to a diagnostic lab that can test for the, for the virus. All right. Uh, these two pictures on the next one come to us from Clyde, Kansas. It's a dahlia, started out solid green. Now it's got variegation on the foliage, slower growing than the others. Is this viral? It certainly looks like it. There is a dahlia mosaic virus that is transmitted by aphids. There's a lot of aphids this year. Um, I would probably um, recommend remo full, full removal of that plant, including that root tissue as well, just to try to prevent it from spreading to the healthy dahlias. Excellent, and one picture on this one. This comes to us from Minden, Iowa, three-year-old Cleveland pear. That's rust. <laughs> it's, it's too late to do anything about it now, um, and it's going to get worse. <laughs> Gosh, thanks. Yep. All right, <laughs> Sarah, uh, you have uh, three pictures on this one. This comes to us from uh, Portsmouth, Iowa. And it's a, a uh, regal petticoat maple. She's showing the picture of what it did look like and then the picture of what it does and then the trunk. She's wondering, is this, uh, is this a tree? We're gonna say this is a goner, let's start over. 
So the purple maples um, don't do great in in really exposed sites. I mean, I see them do better when they have some afternoon shade from some taller trees. So I don't think this was really a great choice for this really exposed location that you have here. Um, the, you've got some dead bark on the trunk there. Uh, that's probably some sun scald damage that happened in the winter time. Um, you've also got a planting depth issue on that tree because the sides of the trunk go straight into the ground, so it's planted too deep. So I think this tree has several strikes against it and you're probably gonna have to take it out and start again. I think you need to choose a different species of tree not a red maple like this, or usually these, um, these red or leafed maples are Norway species. Choose a different type of maple that's more hardy or choose a different species of tree other than a maple. All right, thanks, Sarah. Uh, this is a viewer from Omaha who has a big old American elm and he's wondering, is it okay? That's horrible, yeah, that's <laughs> horrible. Yeah. I, at that point, with that split in it, I wouldn't even really recommend bracing or cabling because that tree is definitely gonna fail at that split. Um, at this, this is the point where you need to seriously start thinking about what that tree is going to damage when it falls, because it will fall. All right, and one more, and this is an Omaha viewer. Uh, they did treat their pin oak with iron last year. Wondering if we think it looks good this year, or will they probably have to treat again next year? I mean, it doesn't look horrible in this picture. Um, it's certainly a lighter green, but then pin oaks are always a little bit lighter green in Nebraska. You may be able to hold off for another year. Um, and uh, honestly, with the drought conditions that we have this year, I, I wouldn't, uh, I would hesitate to do a trunk injection of iron because you could burn the foliage more. So I would hold off for this year and maybe look at it again next year and reevaluate. All right, thanks, Sarah. Well, you know, we've done several features on the benefits of milkweed on our show, and we've talked about how great it is for pollinators. But there is a lookalike plant out there that you might not want in your landscape. UNL's agronomy and horticulture research manager, Cheryl Dunn, tells us what to look for. So, so often we have plants that kind of look very similar to one another. And, and for um, today, I wanted to show you the difference between uh, two plants that, that look very similar. And these are um, essentially like when a milkweed isn't really a milkweed, okay? So we like to think of milkweeds, our pollinators are coming and we want to have those pollinator plants available to them. Um, but one in particular likes to really kind of take over. And I know we're in a grassland setting here, but this one likes to come into your garden as well. What are the similarities of these two plants? First off, here's our common milkweed that we like to have around. This is what our monarchs like to feed on. And this is what's known as hemp dogbane. Now, in the state, we have about 17 different milkweeds. In the state, we just have two different types of dogbane. This is hemp dogbane in particular. So they both have opposite leaves, very similar, right? And they both have a lot of creeping rootstocks. So that's how they reproduce on top of seeds as well. All right, but when we start looking at them even closer, we see that there are some differences. As you can see, the common milkweed doesn't start branching as you go up. It's a single stalk. And this hemp dogbane starts branching as you get um, closer to the top. And then if you look even closer, the petals look a lot different from one another. These have kind of single petals that are sticking straight up. And our common milkweed has petals that are um, actually pulled down. So they look very different when you get really up close to one another. Again, both of them have this super milky sap to it, so that's why I'm wearing gloves, because for hemp dogbane, this is one of the more toxic plants that I'm holding here. And so, um, and, and like I said, the monarch larvae don't like this plant. They do like the common milkweed. But again, once I start cutting them, they start kind of bleeding that milky sap. And so you wanna be careful when you handle this, because if you get that milky sap in your eyes or anywhere else, it's gonna cause some irritation. Even on skin, it can cause some irritation too. Now, the hemp dogbane definitely is very aggressive. Common milkweed, not as much, but hemp dogbane is the one that really starts spreading and starts taking over your garden or your other area, as you can see here too. Now, it does have pollinators that like to come to it, so if you want to keep it in check, you're welcome to keep it in your garden, but my suggestion would be to, to get it out. So in the fall, if you're unsure exactly what you have, this one starts putting on different kind of seed pods. 
they're long and slender. They'll start out green first and then turn into more of a, of a reddish brown color. And then the common milkweed will have almost like a teardrop shaped fatter pod to it. Both of them, again, being in the same plant family, have similar seeds um, that have this white fuzzy appearance to it. Now, to get rid of hemp dogbane, I would definitely, um, you can start pulling it, but remember, it's got a creeping root stalk, so you're gonna have to keep on it. And there are some chemicals that will help take it out, but you can really start working on it by hand. And, and but again, remember, those root stalks are gonna keep putting up plants for a while, but the seeds are very fertile too. Um, and so it would be good if you, if you make sure that you get it before the seed sets. Once you know what to look for, it really should be fairly easy to identify and get rid of it. But like milkweed, they will spread, take over an area if you aren't on top of it, like our backyard farmer garden. Okay, Kyle, uh, two picks on this first one. This is peaches and plums in Grand Island. He did not spray. He's thinking that was a mistake. He was worried about the pollinators. Was that a mistake? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I, I'm glad that he's worried about the pollinators. That's a good thing. But um, it looks like oriental fruit moth. And the second image, I think, you know, they so they start off um, initially going into the shoots and then the later generations go into the fruit like this. And then that when they go in the fruit, they create this entry point for for different rots, you know, pathogens, which I think is what's happening here on the second one. Um, so, you know, I would say in the future, um, you could, there are pheromone traps that are available. So, you know, if it's just a small landscape, you can just probably put one around those trees and um, then monitor for adults in those pheromone traps. And then you can treat treat those trees after uh, petal fall next, next year. All right, thanks, Kyle. Uh, one picture on this one. This is the only picture she sent. She wonders what this larva is on this crab apple. I, you know what? I wonder what this larva is too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really, you know, this one's really interesting to me and I'm, I'm not sure. I've never seen anything quite like this. I don't know what's going on there. So my best guess is this is some sort of fly that like there's a wound here on this tree where it's seeping the sap and some fly larvae are, are feeding here. Um, you know, if this person would like to, to contact me and maybe send a sample into the clinic, we'd be happy to look at it, but I'm not sure just from the picture. Great, and then North Platte, uh, Nebraska had these insects on his Carmen Jewel cherry, and he just, he, he figured it out, and he just wants us to say, don't spray if you don't have to, right? Yeah, well, th yeah, that's great. So it's one thing I always like to remind people of too. So those were, um, those were actually uh, Asian lady beetles, but yeah, when we, we see those, you know, probably he had aphids there, um, you know, and it's often just a good idea to let with, especially with aphids, you know, just let kind of mother nature do its thing and let those natural enemies come in and take care of the aphids for you. You don't always have to do anything. Great, thanks, Kyle. Okay, two picks on this first one, Matt. This is Norfolk. She wonders what this grassy weed is in patches it spreads. She's tried crab grass preventer weed and feed. Okay, so yeah, it looks like uh, smooth brome grass to me, which is a perennial. And it will spread year after year and grow with an extensive rhizo rhizomatous root system. Uh, so getting rid of it out of a lawn is difficult. So what you can do is let it grow up and then wipe on an application of glyphosate and that's probably the easiest way to get rid of it. It might take more than once, but if you can get a lot of those leaves that are a lot taller than your lawn, uh, that's a good way to get rid of smooth roam out of a lawn in a small patch. Excellent, all right. Uh, this is uh, near Tarnov in Platte County. Rectangular area was seeded, the new grass grows better. He's wondering, should he fertilize the old lawn to get the colors to match? Um, I don't know if fertilizer is gonna help you with this one, because if tall fescue is in the middle and then you have Kentucky bluegrass on the outside, this time of year, it's more or less iron chlorosis, and that makes that grass look yellow. And fertilizing it generally doesn't fix that. Applications of iron sometimes help, but uh, just having those two different species, there's gonna be different colors throughout the year. So. Uh, fertilizer, I don't know if it's going to fix that. All right, and two picks on this next one. This is a combination of fescue and bluegrass. The grass started yellowing and dying when the canopy got thick. Um, gets good morning and afternoon sun. He waters. Any ideas on this one? Yeah, I think it's more or less just irrigation and being under a tree, getting more shade so that plant is trying to grow up 
and it can't because it's shaded so heavily because that tree looks like it's pretty low line. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm guessing it's more or less just water, shade, and then that root system of the tree is taking everything. Even with the excess, or if you're putting enough water for the rest of the lawn, it's gonna need twice as much in that area. All right, thanks, Matt. Two pictures on this one, Kyle. Uh, this is a Rocky Mountain juniper. Lost a lot of inner, inner needles. This is from Torrington, Wyoming, and she's wondering, is this too much water or is this maybe a disease? Could be either, honestly, without looking at under, underneath the scope. Um, with junipers, we do have have a few of those needle diseases. If we are seeing death of the, the internal needles, um, I tend to think about Cercospora needle blight. Um, but that the first picture, though, is it was on the end, which made me think it was more um, possibly a cavatina. But regardless, the, those brown needles are not going to recover, so you can go ahead and just prune those out. All right, and you have three pictures on the next one. Uh, this is a Roca viewer. Uh, she knows this is damage that was from compost, and really the question here is herbicide versus anything that is a rot or a spot. It's, I mean, there's a chance that we could be dealing with a virus, but I, it's, it's unlikely. Um, there is a lot of herbicide use right now. Um, especially in our more rural areas, we're getting to the end to the end of the time when, when a lot of farmers can be using some of these growth regulator herbicides, and so there's just a lot, there's a lot of product moving around. And so, as we always say, if you do have produce that is drifted, if it's already set fruit, we cannot recommend that you set, that you um, consume that. But if it is, if it's a low level of drift, um, then that those plants will hopefully come out of it. Just wait, it may take two or three weeks, but if we do are starting to see good growth afterwards in a couple of weeks, the, 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 um, that new growth sets flowers, sets fruit, consume that fruit. All right, thanks Kyle. One picture on this first one, Sarah, this is a Japanese maple about 20 years old in Omaha. Um, it's getting some red leaves. Should she be concerned about this early set of color? Yeah, I don't think that this is anything I'd be too concerned about. If you're making sure the plant is well watered, then it, it, it could be normal. I mean, sometimes some of these more specialty types of maples have red foliage when the new growth comes out. So I'm not sure this is a sign of, to me, that this is a really serious problem. All right, Sarah, um, two from this one. This is in Hoskins. It's a service berry that she thought didn't make it through the winter, but now it's got this lower leaves and these upper leaves. Do we start over? Yeah, I mean, it's trying to come back. I mean, it's up to you um, as the, if you're willing to work with this and try to get it to regrow into a nicely shaped shrub, or if you want to start over. I mean, it is still alive, so it's up to you. <laughs> All right, and one picture on the next one. This is a Blair viewer who has a Shantung maple planted two years ago. Lots of new growth, a little unbalanced. He's wondering, should he prune, and if so, when? The most serious thing I would be concerned about with this tree is it appears to be developing two leaders. So I would, I would choose one leader so that you have a good central leader structure in this tree. And then if you do have some oddly shaped branches and you need to take off some length, you can go ahead and do that. Right in the middle of the summer is not the best time to prune. I would wait until... Um, probably November would be the next best time after the tree has lost most of its leaves because you don't want any new growth coming on just before we go into cold temperatures. So I would wait maybe until it's dormant and then do some pruning on it then. All right, thanks, Sarah. Well, you know, we have some really beautiful blooming plants in our garden and our vegetables are starting to mature. Here's Terry James to tell us more about some of the vegetables in the backyard farmer garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're going to continue looking at what we planted for our 2023 garden. Up in our di distribution garden, we have onions, shallots, and garlic. If you remember last fall, we showed you how we planted the garlic with Sarah. You can check that video out on our YouTube channel. But we're letting it grow and we're letting it get ready to be harvested. We'll know when it's ready to be harvested because all of the leaves will basically kind of fall down and kind of dry up. That's when we're gonna dig all those out and then we're gonna let them kind of air dry and kind of get this little crust on it so they'll store really well for us. We also are looking at some great flowers in our garden and lots and lots of color. So you definitely need to get down and visit the Backyard Farmer Garden. So stop by and check it out. 
course, now it is time for lightning. All right, Sarah, ready? Ready to go. This is the grass clippings question. Uh, they're wondering whether it has, uh, with lawn insecticides and or fungicides treatments, is it okay to put those directly on the garden? No, probably not, but read the label and follow the directions. All right, you mentioned uh, not summer pruning the maples, but we have a viewer who wants to know about summer pruning the crab apples and birches. So you could prune in summer, but it's a stressful time of year for trees and our trees are already stressed already. That's why I was recommending waiting till later in the season. Not to mean you can't do it, but I would say it's not ideal. All right, uh, we have a viewer who has beans that have gotten rusty but he's wondering how far away that he can plant the second or third planting in a vegetable garden. Um, that's a tough question because if you have one garden bed, just putting them a few feet away is not gonna make any difference. So uh, to do rotation effectively, you have to have you know, separate garden beds. So I would say put them where you can. All right, uh, this is a West Point viewer who says there's chlorine in the air from the pool, is that going to be bad on plants. No, it's a volatile gas. It's not going to affect your plants. All right. Nice job. Okay, Kyle, you ready? Always. <laughs> or not. Yeah, it doesn't matter, you know. <laughs> we have somebody who listened to you last week and is asking you to say, what are pycnidia? Pycnidia are a fruiting structure that um, some ascomycete fungi produce, little black pimples, basically. All right, and another viewer who listened next week, uh, the dead man's fingers fungus, will it spread to other trees? Um, it can, especially if you are moving things around, but for the most part, it's gonna stay, stay right where it is. All right, um, this is a brule viewer who has hackberries with the brooms, and they're wondering again what the disease is that's the interaction with the insect. Uh, it's going to be some, some sort of phytoplasma that's most likely spread by urified mite. You're just going to have to prune those witches' brooms out. All right. Uh, we have a viewer who wonders whether fertilizing is the way to cure turf diseases. It depends on the disease. Okay. And it won't cure it, it will mask it, and the turf will grow out of it. All right. We have a La Vista viewer who has leaf spots on Amsonia. Is this fatal? Probably not. Okay. Good to know. Good answer. I, I don't know what I'm probably so maybe. Is. So <laughs> I, I figured you did. Full honesty. <laughs> <laughs> but leaves are overrated, right? Yeah, so you don't need. To. Okay. All right. Are you Are you ready, Matt? Yeah. Let's do it. Um, so, what is the actual cutoff date for doing weed control spraying for 2,4-D? Uh, it depends on the weather, obviously. A lot of 2,4-D products that are used in lawns are at a lot lower rate than you're using for ag, so the cutoff is usually the temperature. So if we cool down for a while, then it can be applied, uh, but you want to be careful because there's just a lot more susceptible plants. All right. Um, ammoniated soaps of fatty acids kill almost immediately. Is that a good thing? Uh, it burns the top off, so depending on the weed, grasses might grow back, but broad leaves might be burned to the ground. All right. Uh, this is a Donovan viewer who said that uh, we mentioned black medic control. Can we mention that again? Black medic control. You'd want to use a multiple product, not one. Like 2,4-D doesn't work very good, so you'd go with something with like fluoroxapir or triclopyr or a little bit of dicamba or sulfentrazone. All right, uh, we have a viewer who had sod laid yesterday in Lincoln, it was 100 degrees. Is there any hope for that sod? Uh, yeah, there is. Keep it moist, but not overly saturated. <laughs> the old moist, but not too wet. Yeah, don't All soak right. it and let it burn up. <laughs> okay, Kyle, you ready? Sure. This is, uh, this is a viewer yeah. who's, who lives near a prairie wild area and came into the house with a tick and wonders, is there a perimeter spray of any sort that will control ticks? Probably not. Um, I, I would just say keep, keep that mode, uh, you know, around your landscape. Um, you know, that's gonna help limit rodents around, which, you know, would sort of help reduce ticks in the landscape. But there are sprays, but I, I'm not sure how long they would really be effective. All right, uh, you mentioned the Japanese beetle control. What about those pheromone traps? Well, in most situations, I, I don't recommend it. it. They usually just bring in more than, than they catch, so usually no. 
All right. This is a Johnson Lake viewer who says the deer flies are biting terribly. Will spraying their bodies with vinegar help? The people bodies, not the insect bodies. I doubt it. <laughs> Okay, uh, and the same uh, Brule viewer is wondering what is the little mite thing that is involved with witches' brooms, and will a miticide work? No, a mite, I don't think a miticide would work. It would be an aerophyid mite, um, and they're like inside of, you know, basically inside of the the plant tissue. It's not going to be affected by something. All right, nice job. Okay. Path one. It's, Path never wins. Uh, we know, it's, <laughs> hey, I'll take it. <laughs> All right. Sarah, what are our plants of the week? Well, we have uh, a, a almost red, white, and blue combination here, which is real pretty for this time of year. So the, the taller purple flowers are a type of Russian, Russian sage, which is very common perennial in our gardens. This is a cultivar called a filigren, which has very finely cut foliage. And it tends to be a little bit shorter and uh, not spread itself around quite so much. So if you have a smaller garden, that might be a good choice. The zinnia here in the front, this is one of the newer All-America selections called Holly Scarlet. And it's a short, compact plant, very mildew resistant, really nice large flowers. So add some uh, really pretty color to the garden in the summer. Then our final flower or plant, I should say, is, is this one right here. This is a, a small tree shrub called button bush. And obviously right now they're blooming. They're covered with all of these, these little flowers. They kind of hang down off these pendulous flower spikes. Uh, pollinators love these flowers. So you'll see all sorts of bees and other pollinators around them. Um, another nice feature of this plant is that they do well in wetter areas. So it'd be something you could plant on the edge of a rain garden or an area of your landscape, maybe where you have a little bit of extra moisture throughout the season. Um, so that is button bush. And that's a really fun, I had to sort of fight off those pollinators to did. pick mm -hmm. those. Mm -hmm. I felt bad sacrificing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Kyle, questions for you. The first uh, here is two pictures. She was watering her tomatoes. She's in Columbus. She saw lots of these on the ground and a few on the lower leaves. They ran away when she turned the water on them. What are they? Uh, they're nymphs of box elder bugs, so they're not going to hurt your anything in your garden. They'll, they'll feed on maple trees. Okay. All right. Uh, you have one picture on this one. This is Omaha, and a couple of these actually came in. They're wondering what this beetle is. This is a grapevine beetle. So the, the adults do feed on grapes, but they're like the mostly leaves, sometimes fruit, but they're, they're not ever economically important, and the grubs just feed in rotting wood. All right. And one picture on this one. Uh, this comes from Decatur. These are munching on five young persimmon trees, and the leaves are covered with these orange insects causing the leaves to curl. Yeah, these are clay-colored leaf beetles, and they, they really do like, like that plant. Um, so, you know, for control on those, um, really any pyrethroid product that's labeled for um, landscape should be effective at controlling those. All right, good job. All right. You ready? Yeah. Two pictures on this one, Matt. Uh, this is a viewer who has a micro, micro clover grass mixture lawn, increased nitrogen, weed control, but now he's got the weeds and he's wanting to control the weeds until it's established but not harm the grass or the clover. Hmm. Yeah, it's controlling a broadleaf and a broadleaf. So one product that doesn't normally kill clover is 2,4-D, but with these temperatures, and if you have an immature stand of clover, it might actually do some damage, but uh, spot spraying with that product might be recommended if you just have patches of weeds. Uh, just be careful with the temperature on that as well. You get too hot, it's gonna kill anything, so wait till we have cooler days than the 100s or 90s. All right, one picture on the next one. Um, this is an Omaha viewer. Again, grass seed and weed problems. Uh, he stripped the top, planted a grass seed mix four to five weeks ago, reseeded two weeks ago. The weeds are never ending. Should he spray, what should he use, and then reseed this fall? <clears throat> yeah, the problem with that is weeds are gonna get worse in the next month. They love this heat, and if we get any, or if you're watering them already, they're gonna grow like crazy. So quinclorac is one product that's safe over the new grass, but if there is no new grass in there, you might be better off just waiting till fall tilling it up because once those weeds get big they are really tough to control even with some of the herbicides that we use um, on new seeding so i would wait till it up and then probably reseed because it doesn't look like there's much grass growing in there anyway 
All right, and one picture on the next one. Uh, this is a viewer from uh, the Blair area, way, or in that location. Small yellow flower. He thinks it's invasive, but he thinks it's beautiful. Yeah, what is it? It's, it is beautiful. It's bird's foot trefoil. It's a perennial, and it's used in a lot of roadsides or people plant it just for the color, basically. It's a nice, nice looking perennial plant, clover. Uh, usually short, grow short growing, and it tolerates mowing too, so it'll keep flowering even after mowing it. So it can be nice. If you All want right. it there. Okay. One picture on this first one. This is Tomato Central for these next ones, Kyle. Uh, this one is Aroma, and she wants to know why the little tomatoes have the little black bottoms. Blossom end rot. Um, it's a calcium deficiency in the tomato. It doesn't necessarily mean that the plants themselves are deficient in calcium, but typically it's um, caused by uneven watering. <clears throat> so try to even out that watering, and the new fruit will hopefully not have those black spots. All right, two pictures on the next one. This is a Fremont viewer who uh, has 20 tomatoes of various varieties. About two weeks ago, one, the whole plant wilted, not for lack of water, and then nine others have joined. He thinks it's too late to do anything this year, but he wonders what happened and how does he prevent it? The, it, it kind of looks like one of our, one of our wilt diseases. Um, there's some fungi and also some bacteria that can cause um, tomatoes to wilt like that. The quickness of the spread makes me wonder if there's not, not something else going on. Um, it is possible to overwater, and that's, I mean, one thing that we've been talking about a lot this year is everything is dry, but we don't want to overwater as well. So um, I would actually split those, um, split those stems of the dead plants and if you're seeing discoloration, kind of brown instead of the nice kind of white um, color that you would expect, then that does indicate a fungus or a, or a bacteria. If they're still kind of clean, then there's something else going on. All right, one picture on the next one. This is Papillion. Her tomatoes look like this. Uh, it could be the same, <laughs> same thing. Same thing. Um, it's really, really hard to tell, um, again, Water, water issues, some sort of root, um, root disease, a wilt, fungus, or a bacteria, we would really need to see a sample to give you a, a better answer. All right, and one more picture. This is South Sioux City. Her raspberries are showing this odd white and then some kind of rotting on the vine thing. Yeah, we don't know um, for Really, the, it doesn't really look like stink bug injury. That there's not, it's not botrytis. It's not really any of the any of the raspberry diseases that, that we typically think of. Could be a sun scald issue, but you know we have some raspberries in the back, and I guess there are some raspberries that just do this. Um, so, but there are some that are rotting um, in the back of this picture as well. So I would try to get rid of that rotten fruit, just so we're not spreading um, having more disease potential there. All right, uh, Sarah, you have two pictures on this first one. This is Vinca, uh, the annual Vinca, and they are turning this yellow color. Is this just nutritional? She did give them miracle Grow. It does kind of look nutritional, but I think it, it may be more of a root issue. If these plants didn't establish well, or maybe they have some kind of a, a root rot sort of a disease that's affecting nutrient uptake, um, uh, that could be the problem here, and that's not terribly uncommon in Vinca. So if they don't perk up, I, I might just be tempted to just pull these plants out and get rid of them. All right, Sarah, uh, one picture on the next one. This is an Omaha viewer that has mandevilla, but the flowers will not open. Mm -hmm. So mandevilla is a tropical plant, and it does like a lot of sun, but I think sometimes here in Nebraska, our afternoons get a little too hot and dry and, and uh, with, without much humidity. So what I'm gonna suggest is maybe you put it into a little bit of shade in the afternoon. So give it about six hours of full sun, give it a little bit of shade after that, and see if the flowers don't open more normally. All right, thanks, Sarah. Well, earlier this spring, we gave you some tips for keeping that grasshopper population down. Wayne returns to show us what happens if you don't get a handle on those grasshoppers early. We talked to you earlier this year about grasshopper control and we have made it to the point of the year where grasshoppers have hatched. We haven't had the hard rainstorms during the hatching period and the nymphs are alive and well and in certain areas in full force working in those uncropped areas, whether it be tall grass, those waste areas outside of people's yards, um, anywhere that 
we weren't disturbing the soil where there was a good egg laying place for them last fall. And we're still dealing with the drought in 2023. Some areas have gotten some rain, some areas have gotten little to no rain. What you need to be doing now is watching those tall vegetation areas for those grasshoppers. If it is full of them, be prepared to start defending your yard and your garden against these small little hopping pests. What these grasshoppers will do is as those taller grasses dry out and mature, they're gonna be looking for something that's lush and green. And unfortunately, that's gonna be your garden areas, whether it be your flower garden or your vegetable garden and your lawn. Some basic things that you can do to help prevent this, mowing your lawn. Great place to, to cut them short. Uh, if you bag, they'll get trapped in there. Some will get caught by the blades. Uh, as we were walking through the park this afternoon, we had no grasshoppers hardly in the mowed part. We got to the taller grass portion. It is absolutely loaded with grasshoppers right now. So that's why we wanna watch those tall grass areas. From there, pick your product carefully that you're gonna use for protecting your yard. Um, there's a lot of products that'll work. Um, basic insecticides um, of any kind typically work on the small grasshoppers. So anything containing carbaryl, uh, the pyrethroids, which includes permethrin, zeta cypermethrin, lambda cyhalothrin. There's a whole bunch of them out there for you to choose from. Put those according to the label where they're supposed to go. If it's for the garden, put it on the garden. If it's for the yard, put it on the yard. That'll be key to help you control those grasshoppers. Treat your border areas first. You might be able to get away with a small border treatment. Then you won't have to treat the entire yard. You can use that as the zone that you're gonna try and protect and hold them down. Uh, it's also a common practice when we're controlling grasshoppers in a pasture situation. We treat the areas uh, in strips and not everything. Those grasshoppers will move into it and be exposed. Pay careful attention. Once those grasshoppers have fully developed wings, they are very tough to control. So that's kind of your window right now. They're still nymphs. They don't have those fully formed wings and you can control them. As of right now, most of those grasshoppers are still small and they can be managed with some of those mowings and pesticides, but don't wait too much longer. We'd also like to encourage you to check out the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel. There are several educational videos focusing on insect control as well as hundreds of other topics. You can also watch those full programs from past seasons. So check it out after the show. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. All right. Announcements. We have two announcements today. Our first one is Daylily Days, July 5th to July 22nd at Harmony Nursery uh, in Bradshaw. And we have the uh, hours on the screen. And our second one is our next, our second Discovery Days, which is July 8th from 10 to 2 here in Lincoln. So that should be a, a great time as well. All right, uh, Wayne, one picture on this first one. This comes to us from Madrid, Nebraska found this worm eating the romaine lettuce. What is it? What can he do about it? It was hidden in the lettuce leaves, so he only found it when he was washing it. Sure, looks like a cutworm. Um, really, they're, they're more of a concern in the spring when they, they are doing what they're, they're name, named for, actually cutting those plants off you know, down at the base. Um, <clears throat> so throughout the summer, you know, we'll have them in, in landscapes, but usually not as big of a concern. So I would say, you know, my recommendation at this point would just be, you know, kind of monitor for injury and then hand pick. Um, they are active at night, so you might need to go in the evening um, to, to look for, you know, those, those caterpillars um, and then just hand pick and destroy. All right, one picture on the next one. Uh, this viewer has Brussels sprouts in a raised bed. He's got holes in the leaves, but can't find any of the culprits. Okay, <clears throat> yeah, so there's a number of different um, caterpillars that that like to feed on um, Brussels sprouts and relatives. Um, so, it, you know, it's hard to say which one, but the good thing is it doesn't really matter because you can manage them all pretty much the same. Um, so again, hand picking is always an option in a small planting, um, but they're all susceptible to BT products as well as um, uh, spinosad. So, you know, either one of those options is, is totally fine. Just make sure you get, you know, good coverage. 
All right, and two pictures on the next one. This comes to us from Bennington. Little green worms eating their way through the petunia blossoms. Yeah, um, these look like tobacco bud worms, and they, they really like petunias. So kind of treatment-wise similar. Um, if you're only seeing them in the petunias, BT is, is an effective treatment. Um, if you have them in other plants like geraniums, they like to feed in the buds, and then in that case, the BT is not going to be effective on those. So um, totally fine, though, just uh, on these petunias. Um, the other option is spinosad. The one thing to be careful about there is spinosad is really toxic to pollinators when it's still wet. So if you, you can get around that basically by treating in the evening after pollinators um, they're, they're no longer active visiting those flowers and then it just dries in a couple of hours and once it's dry it's you know virtually non-toxic to pollinators so um, if you go with a spinosad you would just want to make sure you're doing that late evening. All right thanks Kyle. One picture on this one Matt this is a stump or mm. was and this is what the turf looks like and you have a second picture which is also a stump. Yeah. Uh, from a different viewer, so one's Papillion, one's Lincoln, so, okay. so that's yeah. the second one. What do we do? Um, I don't know. It looks like you have a good stand of grass there. It's fairly young, so getting it through this hot spell in July is going to be a little bit difficult, but uh, just make sure that you're doing adequate watering, not just drenching. Um, that yellowness will go away as the plants mature a little bit, but also make sure you're putting enough fertility down because that old stump is going to use up or uh, probably bind with a lot of those nutrients and not allow the grass to use them. So it might be a little yellower in that spot going forward for a few years. Yeah. The same with this one. It's just those dry, probably uh, hydrophobic areas where it's not allowing the water to go in. All right, a few years is what people don't like to hear. Yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> you almost have to excavate it out a couple feet, three, four feet to get rid of it completely. All right, two pictures on the next one. This is in Fremont. Uh, two spots in the whole apartment complex look like this underground watering, it's mowed and bagged weekly, and this is in Norfolk. Yeah, I don't know. This one looks like it could be some type of disease, or is it Astacida? I guess it could be if it would have been managed a little differently. I don't I don't know. Yeah, and it does look like there's kind of some mowing tracks yep. as well, so I would be curious about a disease there. Too. And it could also be old compaction or something underneath that. It almost looks like it's in a strip where an old sidewalk was. So right. just check the underneath there. Three picks for you, uh, Kyle, on this one. This is Davey, Nebraska, and roses in planters. He thinks is powdery mildew, spider mites, both disease, spider mites, powdery mildew. <laughs> uh, yeah, and it, with, a, with a touch of a botrytis thrown in right. for, for good measure. So there's the, really the, um, at this point, you know, that, that blossom is kind of done for, but the new ones, you could protect them with any of your over-the-counter um, garden, garden center fungicides. All right, uh, two pictures on the next one. This comes to us from Ravenna, Ohio. She thinks it's an oyster mushroom, but uh, it's gilly all the way on the underside. No stem, grows in clusters, stuck fast to the tree. Yeah, it certainly looks oysterish. Um, I've never, this is the first time I've gotten mushroom pictures and I've have, have, have had to ask for a top picture. And so seeing more of it would be, would give us a little bit more information. Could be a chanterelle, but the color is not quite right. So really without seeing that whole mushroom, including the top, it's hard to say. All right. Uh, Sarah, you have two pictures from two different viewers from two different spots of this particular plant. What is this? This is common primrose. It's a wildflower here in Nebraska. And so it's a biennial, grows to a rosette the first year and blooms the second year. So it's not an invasive plant. If you like it, you can keep it, but it's more often considered a weed than an ornamental. All right, one picture on the next one. This is Nebraska City. Wondering, is this a uh, native bellflower that's good or the one that is the runner? It looks more like the invasive species to me, uh, the Campanula ranunculoides. The flowers are, are more slim and downward facing, whereas the Americana has a more open flower and they're a little more upright. So, uh, but to be completely sure, we'd probably need to see a sample. Okay, and you've got about 10 seconds on two pictures, which is these two oaks. Does this one look okay? And does this one, should, should they start over? Tr trim out the shoots on the base of the second tree. The other one looks fine, just maybe needs some shaping. All right, perfect.